are we okay there? Can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, thanks uh, to Twic for the, the invitation to join today's event. And uh, I must apologize now for the fact that I can't stay for the rest of the session after I've given my talk. So I won't be able to hear the other speakers. So apologies for that. Um, what I hope to do uh, in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes is just give you a little bit like Nick um, has done, a taster of some of the climate change impacts on seabirds. So it's very much an overview um, presentation. And what I would say at the outset is if anyone wants to uh, delve deeper on the issues, I would highly recommend that you have a look at the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership uh, Review Report of 2020, which looks at seabirds uh, and the climate change impacts there, and that will give you some more detail. So just uh, starting off in terms of uh, what we do at the Scottish Seabird Centre, um, we're probably best known as a visitor attraction, uh, which had responsibility and had played a big part in the regeneration actually of uh, North Berwick, particularly um, around the, the harbour area and have been established for um, 20 years now. Um, but I think something which has got slightly lost over time and which we're trying to bring much, much more to the fore again is the fact that we were established as a conservation and education charity. And our primary purpose is to inspire, it's to educate people about the marine environment and to prompt them to care for it. Um, and hopefully to engage in, in practical conservation projects too. So as we're going forward into 2021, we've had a, a particularly challenging year as an organisation. Uh, and uh, back in April, um, we, we faced uh, quite a financial crisis, which we've managed to weave our, weave our way through. But, um, you know, going into 2021, what we are really hoping to do is use the visitor centre and our learning facilities much more to educate people about the marine environment in Scotland and to engage people in public engagement there. So as Nick already um, given us is a, a very kind of wide ranging overview of some of the environmental changes that we're seeing from climate change, many of which uh, have been trailed for a significant number of years, um, uh, including the increases to the, the surface and land water temperatures and of course uh, issues such as ocean acidification. And again, the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership um, are reporting that, uh, or they're predicting that and there will be an increase in ocean uh, acidity of 0.366 by 2100. Now that seems like a fairly small increase in acidity, but it's likely to have profound effects on animals with calcareous skeletons. And of course, uh, that becomes a prey species or one of the prey species for uh, many of our seabirds. Uh, around Scotland. So uh, there is good information on what's happening with seabirds in Scotland um, and as 90% of uh, global warming has been absorbed by the oceans it's perhaps not surprising that it's having a, a wide range of uh, effects and seabirds are a very good and a very cost-effective indicator of the overall health um, of the marine environment. And the Seabird Indicator programme involves about 18 organisations. It's coordinated by the, the UK Joint Nature Conservation Committee. And the headline message from the most uh, recently published indicator is that seabirds have declined by about 28% between 1998 and 2019. And there are three main drivers for this. Uh, the first is obviously climate change. We have overfishing, invasive animals and, and, and plants as well. Um, and again, another uh, reference document to point you to if you're looking for more information is to really have a look at the UK State of Birds report, which was just published again earlier this week. And that gives you a very good overview picture of a wide range of wild birds and their population trends. Um, but what that report shows you is the uh, varying degrees of change that we get for seabirds, with Arctic skua being the one which is declining by the most. Uh, it's declined by 80% percent between 1986 and 2018. So we do have uh, uh, good information there on, on what's happening. So 
sitting alongside the trends, we of course also have um, conservation assessments which are conducted both at the international and uh, the national level. And that is very much an evidence-led process, so any data which is gathered is very useful feeding into that process. Um, and the traffic light system which has been developed both at the UK um, and the international level here um, is based on a kind of range of quite complex criteria and a different combination of those um, criteria. So for example, um, in to be assessed as red, you may have to uh, experience a decline of over 50% in the last uh, 25 years. Uh, to be amber, it could be a combination of factors such as a decline over 25 to 50% um, over the last 20 years or breeding at fewer than, than 10 sites. So there's a range of different criteria which are used to assess that conservation status. What I'd like to do now is just give you two or three examples of uh, specific species and uh, what's how they're faring in relation to climate change. And I'm going to start with one of my favourite uh, seabirds, which is the, the black-led kittiwake, which uh, is uh, has a colony down at Dunbar Harbour, which is where I live. So black-legged kittiwakes have experienced quite a dramatic decline um, since the 1960s, a 50% decline. And there is considerable regional variation within colonies. Um, those in the, the north and the west are declining more on average per year, so between 10 to 16 percent, whilst those on the east coast of Scotland are uh, just declining at 3 to 4 percent. But nonetheless, a significant decline overall of 50 percent since the 1960s. And one of this, the reasons for this is probably because as a surface feeder, they can only reach depths of one to two metres and therefore they're very susceptible to changes in prey distribution, uh, both geographical distribution and depth distribution um, as our seas warm. So the kittiwakes are not getting enough nutritional food at peak times, particularly when they're feeding their, chi their chicks and uh, we call this um, a trophic mismatch. Then another very popular um, seabird species, one which is uh, no doubt one of the uh, seabird centres visitors' most popular species, the Atlantic puffin. So whilst the UK population level was actually estimated to have increased by 19% between 1985 and 2002, the Atlantic puffin is particularly vulnerable to um, events. Um, and that's because it's concentrated at a few sites. And one example of this was back in 2013 and 14, when there were quite severe storms which hit the Atlantic coast of Europe, um, particularly um, in France. And that caused a large number of uh, wrecks of seabirds, um, over 55, well, around 55,000 seabirds were killed at that time. And over half of those birds were identified as puffins, um, and they were found uh, when uh, postmortems were undertaken to have empty stomachs, which you know largely indicated that starvation was the the main cause of death for those uh, puffins. So although the the population level has been increasing overall, they are prone to uh, severe events, which can have a very dramatic effect on the population uh, levels. Turning to the European shag, uh, shag um, is a species whose conservation status assessment, both at the UK and the international level, shows that it has quite varied fortunes. Um, in 2018, the UK population had declined by 24% from the, the, the previous census, whereas at an international level, it's considered to be of, of least concern. Now, the European shag is a, is a species which is particularly susceptible again um, to uh, extreme weather events. And uh, a recent study on the Isle of May uh, revealed that very poor overwintering adult survival rates uh, was caused by sustained um, periods of strong onshore winds. Now, it's really thought that one of the reasons why a species like the shag um, suffers more in those sorts of conditions is obviously because it's not uh, just sort of bobbing around on the surface really for its food, but it's having to fly quite hard and quite far um, in order to forage. And therefore it requires more energy for that flight and that results in poorer body condition and a reduction in their overwintering uh, survival. 
So again, like the puffin in a way, but for different reasons, um, the shag um, is prone to pressures from extreme weather events caused by climate change. Turning to uh, uh, another seabird species, uh, the northern gannets, uh, this is one species which is certainly bucking the trend of uh, decline in seabirds. And the last census um, in the Seabird 2000 report um, showed that there had been a population change uh, of an increase of 41%. And, and the largest colony, which is the one that we take uh, much pride in from the Scottish Seabird Centre, the Bass Rock, was reportedly up by 4.4% there. So the gannet is likely to be bucking this overall trend of a, a decline because of the way in which it feeds. So it can travel very long distances, up to 500 kilometres to forage for food. It can dive at quite uh, great depth, down to uh, 15 metres. And because they're feeding in that water column rather than just at the surface, the gannets can get a broader range um, of prey, both pelagic in the open water column and also uh, on the, the bottom dwelling uh, fish and invertebrates, the demersal layer. So, uh, you know, it is faring quite well at the moment, getting quite good fortunes and probably on the sites that it's uh, nesting on, it's not prone to the additional pr uh, pressures uh, from biosecurity, particularly things like rat predation. So uh, there was a, a question um, earlier in, in the chat system about uh, protected areas. Um, so, you know, Whilst we've got climate change impacts on a variety of our seabirds, it is important that they're also um, protected from um, other threats too. And in particular, Nick again highlighted that one of the main threats identified at the best level was uh, the threat of fishing. And that is certainly true uh, in a Scottish context, the threat to habitats, the threat to the kind of prey species from, from industry activities such as overfishing. And it's important that our protection areas are not just lines on maps, that those protection areas have uh, adequate management measures in place and adequate red regulation if they are to be effective. That said, we have got very good coverage in Scotland. 37% of Scotland's seas are protected by uh, marine protected um, areas and or measures of some type. Um, and that's a good start. And just recently in the last week, Scottish Government, Scottish Government seems to have been uh, releasing an awful lot of things in the last week, but just in the last week, um, they announced 12 new additional sites to that SPA network. And those sites are important because they're not just sites which protect the colonies, but they protect the birds whilst they're at sea, provided the management measures uh, go in place there. And several of our, our marine protected areas also aim to conserve uh, sand eel habitats, um, and that will ensure the supply of young recruits to sand eel grounds around Scotland, which is obviously an impor important prey source for seabirds. And looking forward into 2021, we're also expecting to see the launch of a public consultation by Scottish Government on a seabird conservation strategy. Um, and again, these measures will only be effective if they're funded uh, and if they're if they're properly um, implemented in due course. One of the issues that causes us a, a little bit of a dilemma when we're talking about climate change and we're talking about the response to climate change and the impact on seabirds is, of course, offshore renewables. Um, and uh, they can be both um, friend and foe. Uh, no one disputes that we need to rapidly move from fossil fuels to more renewable sources of energy, but these developments obviously also have the potential through collision risk to impact seabirds as they migrate and as they forage. And uh, particularly for us based in the, the Firth of Forth, there are a number of proposals which are already consented there. Um, and we'll be watching to see how the models change as these uh, developments progress and um, uh, look to see how the collision risk is actually playing out um, from these developments. Um, there are other proposals which are in the making in the Firth of Forth as well, such as Berwick Bank and Mar Bank by Scottish and Southern Energy. And it's important that the ecological impact assessments of those proposals are you know, taken into, into account in the decision making. A recently published um, report from uh, Leeds University from uh, Jude uh, Love there is that um, when you look at the Bass Rock, you see differences in the 
adults and the young and differences between the sexes in terms of how likely gametes are going to be um, affected by uh, collisions. Um, so the collision risk is predicted to be higher for females, uh, particularly when they're rearing chicks. Um, and the collision mortality overall is predicted to slow the population growth, but not actually to cause a decline in the, the population growth. But these are all just predictions and we'll have to see as these developments come on stream what the actual effect is going to be. So, um, what we can all do, uh, as I said, one of the things that the Scottish Seabird Centre is responsible for is to try to engage the public and to prompt people about their own actions. And there's kind of a range of things that we talk to visitors about um, in terms of their energy and their travel choices, uh, buying local, um, getting into uh, getting involved in ad advocacy, so such as joining up for the you know the Scottish Environment Light Link Fight for Nature campaign or being engaged in more practical conservation, uh, like our flagship project, the SOS Puffin Initiative, which is about removing uh, the, the non-native tree mallow from the islands in the Firth of Forth, so that the puffins can actually get back into, into their burrows. So there are a range of ways in which people can support uh, conservation. Um, and obviously you all play your part in terms of adding to that evidence and that knowledge base, which is you know, greatly welcomed because without that evidence, uh, we can't make informed decisions. So uh, just thank you again for the opportunity to talk today. If you do want to find out more, you're always welcome to come to the Scottish Seabird Centre or you can uh, follow us uh, on uh, social media channels or our website. As I say, there are some very useful uh, reports on seabirds which are out if you want to look at the detail. And in particular, I'd refer you to the, the Marine Climate Change uh, Impacts Partnership Report, which gives some uh, quite useful insights on seabird fortunes. So thank you. <laughs>